on behalf of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society or the AHA Society. We know many of you are longtime friends as this is our now 13th Celebrate Hamilton. So it's very exciting for us to join together once again. And for those of you who it might be your first time, a very warm welcome. We're so glad to have you with us today. The, this year's Celebrate Hamilton is virtual and we will be hosting a round table. And what we really love about our round tables, which we typically hold at Hamilton Grange National Memorial, of which we're nonprofit partners, is that we just love the dialogue that it allows. And so we'll be, I'll be introducing some of our board members. We also have so many knowledgeable friends and community partners here with us today. So for the next hour or so, we really open it to you all. We would love to hear what topics you would like to discuss as we commemorate the 220th anniversary of Alexander Hamilton's funeral, which was on July 14th, 1804. And I will be sharing a few excerpts from newspapers at the time, but no topic uh, is off the table for today. So like I said, please do go ahead and start putting uh, some of those questions or topics in the chat below. At this time, I would like to welcome first, we have Dr. Richard Silla, our board member. Hello, Dick, great to see you. We have our chair, Mariana Aller. Hello, Mariana, Hi. thank you for being here. We have Dr. Thomas Aller here as well. Hello, hello. And we also have our board member, John Herzog with us. And uh, he is uh, here as well. Hello, John. Oh yes, we do have our other board member, Mary here mm -hmm. with us. Hello, Mary. I don't think her video is on. Hi, I'm but... here. Okay, great, Mary. So glad to have you here. So we are all here, here at your disposal, at your disposal for your questions. And also, if there's anyone else that would like to get on and say a message, I know we have some of our favorite authors here with us today. Would love to hear from you. Uh, now, Dick, I know you had mentioned there was a new book that is uh, about Hamilton that you had mentioned you might like to discuss. Do you want to jump in and share a little bit about that as we get uh, questions yeah, in let, the chat? Let me give a brief introduction to it, and then we can come back uh, because I don't want to take more time than uh, take time away from all the uh, more than 50 people around now. So we've got quite a crowd here. Um, it's a book, uh, I have it right here. Uh, you see it. Uh, it's called The Hamilton Scheme. Now that should title alone should be of interest to us uh, because scheme can have a couple meetings. Uh, the subtitle is An Epic Tale of Money and Power in the American founding. And uh, it's a pretty interesting book. It's by William Hoagland, who was once a speaker at one of our uh, celebrations in lower Manhattan in the, in the uh, summertime. Uh, and uh, uh, it's in some sense, it's a, a bit like other books he's written. He has a book on the Whiskey Rebellion, for example. But um, I think Hamiltonians will, will find this book sort of interesting. It has a kind of a grudging admiration for Hamilton. Basically, you know, a lot of us think about uh, Hamilton in terms of the Hamilton-Jefferson uh, uh uh, debates uh, um, and uh, or the Hamilton Washington versus Madison and Jefferson in the 1790s. Uh, Hoagland recognizes that, but he's doing something a little different. Um, he thinks that the the great debate of the time was you know basically regards both Hamilton and Jefferson as elitists elitists of, with different uh, interests and, and policies, but they're both elitists. And what Hoagland seems to care about is something he calls the democracy, in capital letters, the democracy. And uh, uh, that's a sort of character in his book. And then the other, the other sort of character in the book is what he calls the money connection. And so the book is about the, the democracy uh, versus the money connection, and you can probably guess where Hamilton will be in the, in that. Hamilton is sort of the uh, progenitor, or 
maybe after Robert Morris the second progenitor of the money connection uh, and the democracy is is I think what's interesting about the book if, for those of you who are mainly interested or mainly know about conventional history that's kind of the Hamilton versus Jefferson stuff uh, Hoagland thinks that it's more the the democracy is sort of everybody who's not elite. You know, it's it's the farmers, the laborers, the artisans, uh, uh, the uh, uh, longshoremen. Uh, you know, almost anybody who doesn't consider himself in the elite. And uh, the theme of the book is that, that Hamilton uh, is a kind of has has grave doubts about democracy. And the democracy are these uh, um, um, all those people who aren't in the elite, uh, and Hoagland sort of has great sympathy for them. I mean, if you want to think about who they are and what you may have heard about, it's about uh, you know the Shays Rebellion. Uh, Shays, the Shaysites would be part of uh, Hoagland's uh, the democracy. And then, of course, the Whiskey Rebels are part of the democracy. They're sort of ordinary people who are trying to make America more democratic. And that's not really in the interests of the money connection. Uh, the money connection is sort of speculators, investors, uh, uh, people of wealth, uh, uh, merchants. Uh, uh, th th those are the, uh, uh, the elites uh, and they're part of the money connection, which is opposed to the democracy. And he's, as he goes through the book, um, uh, he says, you know, the Constitution is a Hamiltonian Constitution. That's kind of interesting. <clears throat> we often say that James Madison is the father of the Constitution, but Hoagland thinks that Hamilton, in some sense, was the father of the Constitution. So there's been revisions on that. Uh, Professor Akil Amar at Yale thinks that George Washington is the father of the Constitution. So uh, James Madison is in danger of being replaced as the father of the Constitution by either George Washington or Alexander Hamilton. Um, and Hamilton, it's, it's a Hamiltonian Constitution, he says, so Hamilton wins that battle, and that gives him the power to... Uh, um, uh, organize the nation's finances and uh, he refers a lot to Hamilton's 17 January 1790 report on public credit uh, and he says there are three key, key points two of them are pretty standard Hamilton wanted to pay off the these revolutionary war debts at at par uh, that's that was one of the points of his report and the second one was he wanted to assume the state debts we all knew that but the the third important point that Hoagland says about the Constitution is that, um, or about Hamilton's policies, is that he wanted to tax whiskey. I think, you know, that some of us know about the whiskey tax, but Hoagland makes this into the, you know, one of the three main points of Hamilton's financial reforms. And the reason Hamilton did it is because he wanted to go after these uh, ordinary people, the democracy, uh, many of whom produce whiskey in Western Pennsylvania. Now, Western Pennsylvania was in the news yesterday. Uh, it seems like there was still uh, uh, some rowdies out there. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, you know, so, but you know, one of the themes of the book is that Hamilton sort of self-consciously put in the whiskey tax because he wanted to get these ordinary people who are, made their living uh, uh, making whiskey uh, and uh, you know it, it's an interesting argument it's it seems to me to be blown up a little bit in the book but it, it's interesting uh, and of course then Hamilton and George Washington and Henry Lee go out and put down the whiskey rebellion and so Hamilton wins on that one he won on the constitution he wins on his financial policies uh and his goal, Hoagland recognizes, is that he wants to make America into having a very strong economy and make it into a, uh, you know, a, a player on the international stage or a, a country that uh, you know can um, be with the, the other major powers of the world. And he sort of wins on that too. But uh, Hoagland raises these points of, uh, uh, you know, did we sacrifice democracy? Or you might say, uh, since the founding fathers were not all that democratic, most of them, um, the um, 
Uh, you know, the, our history is a, a struggle to make America more democratic after the founding fathers didn't want it to be so much that way. And there's a, other interesting things. Uh, he he, th he says, I think it was William Findlay, uh, sort of, uh, dem uh, you know, uh, sympathetic to those uh, ordinary people that Hoagland is sympathetic to. Um, you know, I, he... he uh, uh, apparently, when Hamilton was winning his battles in the early 1790s, uh, Findlay said uh, they should rename New York Hamiltonople, <laughs> like Constantinople. Uh, and that reminded me of uh, uh, reading that book by Mike Wallace on the history of New York City. That in, in the, when the Constitution was ratified, uh, that book on the history of New York City says that some people in that parade, uh, you know, the, where they had the ship Hamilton and after the, uh, uh, well, New York was still debating, I guess, but the Constitution had been ratified. Uh, and uh, uh, somebody suggested they rename New York City Hamiltoniana. So now we have two choices for renaming New York City, Hamilton Opal or Hamiltoniana. Uh, the little things like that are you pick them up in the book. And uh, I hadn't heard about Hamilton Opal before, but I thought that was interesting. Anyway, it's, it's quite a, if, if you have any more questions, I, I, just, I say I don't want to hog the meeting here. But um, uh, if you have any more questions on the book, I'd be glad to uh, say some more about it. Thank you, Dick. Well, it's always wonderful, you know, all these years that we still have new books coming out, covering, there's so many topics that we can delve into about Hamilton's life, since he was so multifaceted and really was involved in so many different items. So that is really wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, if you have any other questions as a follow-up, please let us know in the chat. Uh, I love the idea from Adam, uh, Adam Levinson, who is one of our good research partners. Adam, would you like to join and maybe just spend a minute if you're free, uh, since you've really been leading the charge about the um, possible historical marker application in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania that highlights Hamilton's time uh, during the Constitutional Convention. Sure. I'd also just like to, looking at the names, uh, mention, do a shout out. Lynn Aubrey has joined us. I don't know that we can yet consider her to be a Hamilton, but she, a Hamiltonian, but she is a descendant of John Simmons, who was the the, the, the tavern operator, uh, which was located right near where Hamilton lived on Wall Street. And uh, that's a, an ongoing conversation. I, I see that we've got some Hamilton descendants, but now we have a descendant of another uh, founding father broadly defined. So that's the Simmons family who were related to the Daly family, and that's the subject of the of, of the pending markers. So I wanted to point out that the AHA Society, uh, and uh, you know, there are several board members who've signed the application to the state of Pennsylvania, and this is to recognize the location on Market Street. And some of you may know, if you've been to Philadelphia, that Market and 7th is where you have the deck house. What's the deck house? That's the location where Thomas Jefferson brings Sally Hemings' brother, Robert Hemings. This is during the summer of 1776. At the time, it was known as the as the uh, the Graff House, G R A F F, and today we call it the Declaration House because a little document was written there by Jefferson in 1776. Maybe some of you have heard of it. So in Philadelphia, the point is that they, they have honored its hallowed ground, the location where the Declaration of Independence was drafted. That's the Deck House. But I'm asking the question to everybody, and it's the subject of a pending book: Where was the Constitution? drafted declaration was drafted at the declaration house where was the constitution drafted and the quick answer is if anyone wants to google it miss d-a-l-l-y apostrophe s it's also spelled d-a-l-l-e-y so after all kinds of archival research and the background, not to go on too much today, but the background is that Jefferson was a member of a five member committee. And you've seen the images of that famous mural of Jefferson presenting the declaration in 1776. Uh, by the way, there was a holiday just happened last week. Uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence results in July 4th. So Jefferson is on that committee with Sherman, with Livingston, with John Adams, and with Ben Franklin, that famous image. So it was a five-member committee. Jefferson was the member who was appointed, if you will, to do the declaration, the first draft. There were various changes to it that he's not happy about. But fast forward to 1787. In 1787, of course, the Constitution is debated, is formulated, it's signed at Independence Hall. But my question is, where was it drafted? And the answer is, if you can locate the location where 
the penman of the Constitution. Uh, this is Gouverneur Morris. And I think a lot of the Hamiltonians should all be uh, similarly uh, fans of Gouverneur Morris or Gouverneur Morris. So the point is that there was another five member committee. It's the Committee on Style and Arrangement. And that committee has Madison, uh, who we could debate about being the father of the Constitution. I would argue that there was no one single father or mother. It was a collaborative effort. Uh, but I would point to this Committee on Style and Arrangement as arguably one of the most important committees because not only is Madison on it, but our boy Hamilton is on it and Gouverneur Morris. And Gouverneur Morris is the one that uh, famously is referred to as the as the, uh, the penman of the Constitution. So Gouverneur Morris is assigned the job of Jefferson from 17, 1776. Gouverneur Morris is the one. And by the way, any of the five members of this committee, Rufus King is on it. Also, uh, William Samuel Johnson is the chairman. He's the one that sort of shepherds these brilliant geniuses, many of them New Yorkers, by the way, on this committee on style and arrangement. So the point is we now have, after all kinds of archival work, uh, and it's absolutely an airtight case because we have the actual receipt of Gouverneur Morris boarding at Miss Daly's boarding house. And we know from a letter from uh, Rufus King, I'm sorry, from Elbridge Jerry, that Hamilton was there in August. It remains to be seen if Hamilton was also there in September, but Hamilton absolutely boarded there with uh, Gouverneur Morris in, uh, in August, but probably also September, although that's a, a question mark to verify. So anyways, that's the, this application is pending in Philadelphia. Uh, we're anticipating it'll be a big deal for America 250, and the DAR is going to come marching, or the SAR, with uh, all kinds of events that are hopefully being planned and exhibit. So stay tuned to 2026, and uh, thank you for the, allowing me to give that quick introduction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. And, you know, it's just really so exciting to, even all these years later, still be discover having new discoveries. Uh, and even though they can seem small, they really have a lot of implications. And I think it's special when one has the opportunity to go to a city and find those new Hamilton connections. And, you know, even though we associate Hamilton so much with New York City, the connections that he has in Philadelphia are not only special in his life, but very poignant for the nation's history. So we're very excited about all of that research about the uh, boarding house of Miss Daly. And it'll be wonderful to have that represented on the historical marker uh, circuit there. I love Diana's question here. I'd like to hear about some of, some of the highlights of previous July AHA celebrations you've enjoyed. Well, we certainly have many, many uh, incredible events that we've held over the years. I will name a few of mine, and then I'd love to hear from some of the other board members. And for those of you, I know many of you have traveled to New York City and New Jersey specifically for our Celebrate Hamilton event. So please chime in with some of your most memorable moments. I think for me, our very first Celebrate Hamilton, we actually took a ferry boat from uh, New York over to Weehawken to replicate the route that Hamilton would have traveled the morning of the duel with Aaron Burr. And it's actually where we had the first opportunity to meet Michael Newton, who's been a great friend all these years. We also, at another point in time, uh, traced the original funeral procession route uh, that Hamilton's funeral followed uh, his his casket brought to Trinity Church. So that was a very special, memorable moment. Uh, and of course, also the um, opening of the Hamilton musical was right around that time. So we had a very uh, big celebration that year uh, and with many of our friends to go see the opening of the musical. Um, of course, all of our events at Trinity Church and Hamilton Grange have been very memorable. And then I think for me, what I, I've loved all of our events in New Jersey as well, because again, there's a lot of connections in New Jersey. So Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, but one of the most impactful for me was when we had our young immigrant Hamilton tour in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And we actually had the understudy of Hamilton for the Hamilton musical, who was from the Elizabeth area. He grew up there, he was an immigrant himself, and he had no idea that Hamilton had had these connections. And like Hamilton, this actor was self-made, self-taught, and 
just had that same passion and drive about Hamilton. And as we were doing this Q&A, we were able to surprise him with his drama teacher from high school, from the area that he hadn't seen in all those years. And I mean, just something like that to witness his not only greater appreciation for Hamilton and realize, wow, he was a real person like me and all these connections, but to witness that personal moment was really, really beautiful. I'd love to hear from some of the other board members of your uh, highlights from Celebrate Hamilton's of years past. Well, one um, is Mariana Oller here. Um, one summer we were in a Mid-Hudson um, basically um, mid-Hudson Valley. So uh, the Aha Society did, who knows, maybe 15 events at different sites, uh, but it was incredibly memorable for me to be in Poughkeepsie, uh, where, of course, uh, New York ratified the Constitution, <clears throat> and we were all there um, standing on the street, going to the post oh. office, just doing so many um, wonderful events at different places, and including the Poughkeepsie Historic uh, Cemetery, and across the street, uh, the river into the Washington uh, headquarters. We went up and down the river uh, that um, beautiful summer, and I remember even, I believe, Lin-Manuel Miranda <laughs> had um, come up with uh, his future team for the musical Hamilton to perform a little snippet of it. And some of our board members uh, were able, and other guests were able to uh, see that. And we kind of sensed that there is something major coming uh, at that time, it was way early. I think it was 2013, wasn't it, Nicole? I was either, I wouldn't say it might've been 2014. 2014. I have to remember when the, it was the 225th anniversary of New York ratifying the constitution. Yes, so so. It, okay, so it must have been 2020. 20, I thought it was 2013. <gasps> it might be, yeah. Anyone else that was there at the time? <laughs> I have some <clears throat> memories to share. Yes, I, I remember that. That was a wonderful series of events. And I remember the Poughkeepsie event very, very happily. But uh, one of the highlights for me was my first trip to Nevis, uh, which occurred because I had just met Tom and Mariana, and they were going to Nevis. And they mentioned that to Diana and me, and we said, well, okay, we'll go too. And we had a wonderful time in Nevis. The so that was a very high point for me and for Diana. Wonderful. And I see Michael Newton chiming in. Too many to highlight the musical and the dinner that we had before that. And... Uh, also, Marty, great, great point. Joanne Freeman's emotional telling of the events on the dual day. She's such a compelling speaker. And I would say too, uh, Victoria Johnson, she spoke in Weehawken a few years ago. And even though you know what happened, the way she told it, you're on your edge of your seat. It's just the narrative that she had was so powerful. She had a really incredible book written about Dr. David Hasek, who was the physician in attendance at the duel and, and a friend of both Burr and Hamilton. So, uh, just so many, I mean, too many amazing speakers to count. And, and yes, Michael, uh, the day we visited Newburgh, visiting the various Washington headquarters and sites, the cemetery tour by Elliot D. and Elizabeth at Snyder Academy, where Hamilton studied in the graveyard. And for me, one of the highlights was uh, Doug Hamilton, who's here with us, that he gave a tour of the Hamilton family in the Poughkeepsie Cemetery. And that was before we saw uh, the original reading of the Hamilton musical back in, yeah, I think you were right, Mariana, 2013. And then also the uh, Sleepy Hollow tour. To me, those two tours, to have those personal connections, the family stories, I just still think about that to this day. It was very, very special. 
and as Michael says, our, our Nevis trip for the statue unveiling, that is my background here, is the statue that we unveiled as part of Celebrate Hamilton activities two years ago, and certainly a highlight and culmination of our more than decade plus work uh, with the Caribbean and, and recognizing Hamilton's Caribbean roots. So thank you, Diana, for a great trip down memory lane. It's, it was great to remember all of the many wonderful events and historic sites we visited, having the Hearts of Oak perform as we marched down to Trinity Church is another one. Uh, it's just been so wonderful, the community that has come together for our Celebrate Hamilton programs over the years. We have another question here from, just scrolling back up through the chat here, from Amit, who would like to hear more about Hamilton's connections to Judaism and the Jewish community. So I'm sure Michael Newton can uh, chime in more in the chat, but uh, there are myths out there that have been thoroughly debunked that Hamilton himself was Jewish. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why that became a myth, but he did have a great respect from the Jews. He recounted uh, years later that he had been uh, schooled in the school of a Jewess, and likely it was on the island of uh, of uh, St. Eustatius or Stacia. And uh, the uh, some of the AHA board members a few years ago actually visited the ruins of what was a very prominent synagogue on site. And so it's very likely that Hamilton would have passed through that area uh, since there was a very large and active Jewish community at that time. And so that was very special. And there are records of Hamilton quoting uh, comments on the Jews a quote from their earliest history to the present time has been and is entirely out of the ordinary course of human affairs. Is it not then a fair conclusion that the cause is also an extraordinary one? In other words, that it is the effect of some great providential plan. The man who will draw this conclusion will look for the solution in the Bible. He who will not draw it out ought to give us another fair solution. So Hamilton really had a lot of respect and, as he said, personal connections, uh, though he was not Jewish himself. So if anyone else would like to chime in to the chat there. Uh, and then we have a question here from Eric Braverman. Could you explain more details how Hamilton sold 30-year bonds in an era where the currency was on the edge of collapse? I can understand 5, 10, 15 years, but long-term investment is like selling pie in the sky or solar system bonds. Uh, I will turn that over to some of our more financial uh, experts if they would like to answer this question of Eric's. Well, uh, I would say that uh, he didn't really sell 30-year bonds. Uh, the initial bonds of the government were pay payable at the pleasure of the government. The situation was he was taking a big gamble. I think this is one of the biggest gambles of his life, that he, somehow the federal government would get enough revenue so he would be able to pay the interest on uh, the newly uh, uh, the new debt that he was issuing to replace the old debt. You know, there was a 6% bond and a 3% bond and a 6% bond that didn't pay any interest for 10 years. And I, I think uh, Hamilton came up with that sort of structure of the debt because uh, it was a way of keeping the interest costs down at a time when the government had limited revenues. But the bonds weren't 30 years, uh, Eric. They were They were payable at the pleasure of the government. Uh, and so it wasn't really... Uh, uh, and though I would also say that the currency was in the process of being reformed then too. You know, the constitution uh, actually took away the right of the states to issue paper currency. And Hamilton's going to follow up on that with his mint report in uh, uh, January 1791, uh, which is going to define the dollar in terms of gold and silver. So there was a currency reform going on at the same time Hamilton was restructuring the debt. So um, it wasn't a question of... Uh, uh, being able to sell bonds when people had doubts about the currency, the currency itself was being reformed right along with the debt. Rich, it took me a long time to figure out that the $10 per slave tax was the, the Southern way of making sure that the a Northern way of making sure the currency didn't collapse. In other words, if you go from a hundred dollars down to $1 in value, which is what happened with continental dollars, you prop up the currency. If you, 
fixed the price of the slave at $10 because then the South had a vested interest not to let the currency collapse? That's really the question. Is that really a currency collapse measure? How did they come up with $10? That puts it into a question. I'll get off. Well, I think my my understanding on that, which may not be as good as, as somebody like Michael Newton's, is that um, uh, that tax was put on to discourage uh, the the slave trade. You know, the slave trade could not be uh, 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 ended for twenty years until eight, eight, January eighteen oh eight, and uh, um, so that was kind of you know, pro South. And the slave tax, uh, I think most most Northerners didn't like the slave trade, and even people like Thomas Jefferson didn't like the safe slave trade, which is condemned, I think, in the De uh, Declaration of Independence. So a lot of Southerners and most Northerners uh, didn't like the slave trade, and putting the tax, you know, recommending that this tax, which had a cap of ten dollars, I think. The slave values were probably more like uh, between 100 and 200 dollars, and um, the tax was uh, a way of uh, discouraging the slave trade, uh, which was allowed to continue for 20 years. Um, but I think that that particular tax was never enacted. You know, it was just allowed by the Constitution. I don't recall ever seeing any government revenue coming in from that tax. So I think the Constitution allowed it, but Congress never enacted that tax on slave imports. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. And, and David comments in Hamilton also initiated a way to extinguish the debt by creating a of a sinking fund. Fantastic. And uh, we also had a few uh, people in the chat share some more sources if you want to learn more about Hamilton's Jewish connections, a few recommended books. And uh, Michael shared the quote uh, that his son, John C. Hamilton, wrote that his father, quote, mentioned with a smile his having been taught to repeat the Decalogue in Hebrew at the school of a Jewess when so small that he was placed standing by her side upon a table. Uh, and Michael also shares that Hugh Knox, one of Hamilton's mentors, also knew how to read Hebrew. Hebrew was required in year four of King's College, but it's not clear that it was actually followed and Hamilton had left school early when the war broke out. So thank you uh, for chiming in there, Michael. Well, while we wait for uh, more questions or topics that you all would like to discuss, I would like to read, since we at the AHA Society are very big on primary source documents, an article in the newspaper from July 13th announcing death of General Alexander Hamilton. New York, July 13. General Hamilton died yesterday at about two o'clock, surrounded by a multitude of friends who were anxiously watching each motion of the man they dearly loved and were about to lose forever. The closing scene of his life was solemn beyond description. In the morning, he had requested the bishop be sent for. When the bishop came, he requested his friends should be present at the conversation between them. He declared in the most solemn manner that when he went to the field, he had determined not to fire at Colonel Burr, that he bore him no malice and was dying in peace with all men. And he hoped, with his God, that he was perfectly reconciled to his fate, that he knew his friends would lament the manner of his death. He did so himself, for he is, has always abhorred the practice of dueling, but uh, both upon political and religious reasons, but that circumstances had rendered it impossible for him to avoid it. The bishop then went to prayer with him, and if anything could have changed the unchangeable decree of providence, it would have been this prayer. About 20 gentlemen were present, and on their knees, in a flood of tears, imploring heaven to bless their friend. Such a scene as this was enough to rend a heart of adamant. Of all who were present, the general alone appeared tranquil and happy. His firm soul was unappalled at the approach of death, and he calmly bid his friends farewell, begging them to cease from mourning, for he was happy. He expired without a groan and retained his senses to the last moment. Upon opening his will, there was found a letter. The friends of Mr. Hamilton have joined in a request to Mr. Gouverneur Morris to deliver an oration at his funeral tomorrow. He has promised to do so if he can sufficiently conquer his feelings. New York never exhibited so much gloom as it does present. 
the pride of our city is gone. So that is a one account of announcing Hamilton's passing. I would love to hear from all of you what you think about that, some of your own favorite quotes or letters from Hamilton. I got something. Um, yes, please. I love how he's very determined and very like knowledgeable and um, nothing. If he has an idea, he will put it into action. And it's just that determination, that hard determination, that drive that embodies the American spirit of who we are. And that is just so honorable. And that's makes him a great man that he is. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. We appreciate you sharing that. We'd love to hear from anyone else, their thoughts or reactions. Adam is commenting that uh, the scene that you described reminds me of Washington's farewell to his officers on December 4th, 1783. Oh, and Adam also asks, uh, he's trying, to, he's doing a lot of research to try to figure out whether Alexander Hamilton attended George Washington's farewell address to the officers on that day. The only primary source documenting the event was written by Colonel Talmadge, which doesn't men mention all attendees. And there has been this long time um, narrative that Hamilton did not attend this farewell gathering because Washington and Hamilton had fallen out. Uh, so it would be interesting to see what you find, Adam. We know if anyone's going to find some of that information, you're a good one to put onto that research. And, uh, and as Adam says, of course, the farewell was at Francis Tavern, where we have also had many wonderful uh, events. <laughs> and we have um, a note here from Bruce Weir. Hamilton was also involved in other less well-known efforts that helped many others, such as the creation of the Trustees of Sailors Snug Harbor Foundation in 1801, which funded and operated a retirement home for old and injured mariners on Staten Island from 1833 to 1976, which helped 10,000 mariners, including my ancestor. Hamilton helped draft the will for wealthy New York City merchant Sea Captain Robert Richard Randall, which created the trustees of Sailor's Snug Harbor Foundation. I really love that you share that um, because to me, one of the things that most attracted me to studying more about Hamilton so in depth beyond the fascination with what he did for the country from a political perspective and an economic perspective is really everything he did on a personal perspective, the fact that we have, even to this day, schools and foundations that exist because of his involvement, his efforts, the fact that uh, the African Free School was one of the first schools to provide uh, education to young African American children free of charge uh, on, under the auspices of the New York Manumission uh, Society, that there is uh, the Erasmus Academy out in, I believe, Brooklyn, uh, that he helped star so much of what he did from a humanity perspective is really what inspires me to continue learning and sharing his story. So I, I thank you, Bruce, for sharing that because that is one of the very lesser known uh, items about his life. Yes, when I discovered my ancestor resided there, I was really surprised to learn the history of the creation of Sailor Snook Arbor. The Sailor Snook Harbor campus was like 100 acres. It was a huge complex. And it was kind of ingenious how they funded it. The Randalls were wealthy <clears throat> merchant sailors. Uh, they were actually privateers during the French Indian War and also during the American Revolution. And they used their money. They wanted to give it back. Um, they actually were involved in the creation of the Marine Society in 1770 and actually had a charter um by the king george and later they wanted to help all sailors so they wanted to give their money back and in the 1790s hamilton was their friend and their attorney i'm also a graduate of hamilton college and if you don't know the story of hamilton college well 
Alexander Hamilton was a friend of Samuel Kirkland, who was a missionary to the Iroquois, and he wanted to start a school in the 1790s. And he gave him some money, and he was actually on the board of trustees. And it was actually Oneida, uh, Hamilton Oneida Academy originally. And some of the first students of the school were actually Oneida Indians and settlers in the area. And then that school, after Hamilton died, became Hamilton College in 1812, was chartered as a college. I'm a graduate of that college. So, um, and on top of that, which is kind of surreal, is guess where I live? In Cincinnati, Ohio now. Cincinnati is in Hamilton County. So I know Douglas Hamilton, you're on here, and you live up in Columbus. <laughs> Yes. So I was wondering if you knew about Sailor Snug Harbor. I had not heard about Sailor Snug Harbor. Uh, and so thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, you mentioned the Navy, and maybe some of you have seen that at the end of May, the Navy announced that they were going to uh, build a new ship. It was uh, It's a guided missile frigate, and it will be named Hamilton. So that's the mm -hmm. uh, latest there. Uh, we have a comment here from David Callan. I always like this part of a Hamilton letter to Edward Carrington about the fight to create the Bank of the United States. Reflecting 15 months later in 1792, he said, A mighty stand was made on the affair of the Thank bank. you. <laughs> Thank you, please. A mighty stand As was made on the affair of the bank. In that case, I prevailed. And the reason I like, you know, short to the point, and I prevailed, which we know H often did. <laughs> That's true. And I love his wit, too. He always has the funniest ways of, of phrasing his victories or uh, using his sarcastic uh, wit in, in stories. So thank you, David. That's wonderful. And David is representing the Museum of American Finance, also a longtime partner and the earliest celebrators of Alexander Hamilton since the 1980s of always making sure that his graveside was marked with a wreath, a memorial wreath on the anniversaries of his birth. Right, that's thanks birth to John Herzog, obviously. So thank you, John. Yes, thank you, John. So wonderful to continue this tradition all these years. I have a question in terms of the lighthouses, where are they located? Because that'd be cool to go and see if there's actually any working, you know, Absolutely. Great question. It's been a few years since I've done the research, so I'll have to go back through my articles. I believe that he was involved with the one on Cape Hatteras. Uh, I think that's the one that's also nicknamed Hamilton's Own. Uh, and there is another one that he had commissioned, either that one he had commissioned to be built as one of the first public works projects under the federal government. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll have to see if I can dig up the old article that I wrote on Hamilton and lighthouses. Uh, he great. actually helped push through a bill uh, for lighthouses uh, in the first years of the government and was essentially because it fell under the purview of the Treasury Department through oh, wow. um, his work with the Coast Guard. He really oversaw a lot of that. And I believe that when they commissioned several lighthouses he helped decide where the best locations were but again my my memory is a little really fuzzy cool. since it's been a few years but I will I'll try to dig that up and share that because really fascinating how he was the first superintendent of lighthouses for the U.S. and so much of the early lighthouse uh, work under the federal government was thanks to him and and really he was so smart because when he was trying to create the Coast Guard uh, you know what we call the Coast Guard today uh, he really knew to rely on the local knowledge of those from each area that he wanted the ships to protect. And so he not only hired experts of the local regions, but also hired the shipbuilders because who would know better the needs of that area than those that were there? Some some regions would need shallower, um, lighter ships that could travel faster due to the topography of the coastline, whereas others maybe had to go out deeper into sea. And so each, you know, he knew not to do a cookie cutter approach to the ships and it would have been cheaper mm -hmm. for him to, you know, just build you know, the first 10 ships in Philadelphia and send them out. But he really took into account 
the local needs. And so I find that really fascinating as well. And he so must have convinced, you. he had to convince each audience that he was trying to approach in trying to get those lighthouses. I mean, just think about the energy and the effort, you know, just try to persuade even the government to go behind and believe in his public works. I mean, that's just impressive, the amount of pure power and determination, ambition. It's just amazing. Thank you so Actually, much. When you consider it was just one fragment of his responsibility as a secretary of treasury but he wow. in typical hamiltonian fashion he was paying attention to every single detail what the uniforms should be what the pay should be for everyone who should be on board he really spelled it all out so it's it's always remarkable uh when you yes. learn of thank that. you yes Recent, thank you Corey. recently i noticed that nicholas kruger was a supplier of materials for those lighthouses and so um mm -hmm. It looks like Hamilton kept in touch with him. And in fact, in the genealogy, there are many Krugers that uh, ended up to be descendants also of Hamilton through subsequent marriages two and three generations down the road. So we have a, a lot of Krugers also in the family tree. Oh, that's amazing, Doug. Wow. I, I, yeah, that's incredible. And I did not know that. So that's an interesting find. Makes sense. You know, if you know someone you're going to trust, you're going to trust he's going to provide Good materials. <laughs> and uh, Bruce, see. you mentioned um, uh, the Maritime um, uh, College. Uh, you know the name of that building that they're uh, located in is um, Fort Schuyler, which I always uh, I thought that was interesting. That... Nicole, can you ad address the problem where they label Hamilton okay. against the Bill of Rights. It seems pretty clear to me that the Bill of Rights would have uh, interfered with the ratification of the Constitution. No one was going to agree on the language. It took to, you know so long to even get the Constitution written. And if they would have attached the Bill of Rights right away, you would have not had a ratification. So it's not true that he was against the rights. He just uh, didn't want to delay ratification. Well, one of the quotes uh, that I've re read in, in Hamilton's writings of his concerns with establishing this Bill of Rights is that that could then be used to delineate that other things were not rights of citizens and that then at what point do you stop? And he had a uh, cause for concern because of, I don't remember exactly how long after, but that w at one point was brought up in a Supreme Court case to say, well, this specific right is not actually in the Bill of Rights, therefore it is not something to be protected. And that was one of the things that Hamilton was concerned about regarding the Bill of Rights beyond any ratification efforts. If anyone else has more that they wanna chime in on that, I know Michael shared uh, some good resources on that as well. Oh, and thank you, Adam, for uh, adding, it was the Cape Henry Lighthouse uh, that was the first lighthouse built under the Lighthouse Act of 1789, making it the first federal construction project under the new federal constitution. And uh, yeah, Michael's uh, yeah, I was just gonna, yeah, I was just going to reply to Doug there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was muted. Yeah, I've, the records for Salus Snug Harbor are in Fort Schuyler, and there's a library in there that's very cool inside the fort. Mm -hmm. And they have an awesome uh, model ship collection also in there that's right. inside the fort. So. Yeah, I saw that about a year ago. I did a, a presentation there on Hamilton. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Did did you? Okay. But you didn't know the, yeah, they have uh, the Marine Society records also are in the library there. It's very impressive. And they do a great uh, Constitution Day program, and they really focus on Hamilton there from the Fort Schuyler connection. I've spoken there a few times. Uh, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, I think location. recently I saw there actually uh, Robert Richard Randall. They have a statue at Snook Harbor. They have a second statue that they're giving to the Maritime College. So he's the founder you know, of Snook Harbor. So, oh, wonderful! Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, Michael here has a uh, comment that David Cowan's quote reminds me of something Elizabeth Hamilton said, and this is also a quote I love. Quote. I sat up all night with Hamilton to help him do it, write out uh, his argument on why 
the bank, the first bank in the United States was constitutional and should be considered constitutional because uh, Washington was trying to decide whether to approve the bill that had been passed by Congress uh, because he had cabinet members such as Jefferson saying it would be constitutional. So Hamilton came back and had this huge treatise on arguing why it would be constitutional. I sat up all night with him to help him do it. Jefferson thought we ought not to have a bank and President Washington thought so. But my husband said, we must have a bank. I sat up all night, copied out his writing, and the next morning he carried it to President Washington and we had a bank. <laughs> so that is such a great story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then another great quote here. There are many who think such addition unnecessary and not a few who think it misplaced in such a constitution. My own opinion has always been in favor of a Bill of Rights. At the same time, I have never thought the omission a material defect. I have not viewed it in an important light. That was from James Madison discussing Bill of Rights, circling back to that conversation. Oh, Elizabeth, uh, you had your hand up. Would you like to uh, speak? Um, well, I just wrote it in the chat. It was just that um, your dear dad, Rand, had organized a wonderful AHA Society event. Oh about two years before COVID, if I can use that as a milestone, uh, at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, if you recall that, near New Haven, Connecticut, where we gathered to see a, an impressive statue of Hamilton that had just been erected there. And your dear dad spoke very well. Mary Hamilton was there. I think Doug was there and quite a few of you. It was a beautiful overnight event, actually, with some dinners and chats. But the memory of Rand talking about the statue was one that um, stays with me. I'm sorry, I've never been to Nevis to see that statue, but hope to get there soon. Let me know if you're organizing another trip in January and I'll be sure to go. Anyway, I have to leave Nicole, but thank you for a marvelous, marvelous Zoom. You are a great organizer and a wonderful champion of our hero. So bye-bye. Oh, well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you for joining us. Always so great to have you involved with our events and I've had you speak for so many years. Thank you. And and yes, uh, what Elizabeth uh, is referring to is that as one of our many uh, initiatives of the AHA Society is we often serve as historical consultants. And so uh, one of the former classes of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, Hamilton being the founder of the Coast Guard, wanted to erect a statue of Hamilton on the grounds of the Academy. Amazingly, there was not one there. And so the class raised the funds and they spent several years uh, designing it. And so we worked for those years to, with the sculptor and with the Academy to help consult on the historical accuracy, what they wanted to portray. Uh, and they ended up with a really beautiful design, a really symbolic design. And so uh, the statue holds a scroll that is open and the author actually, or the sculptor actually made sure to copy Hamilton's uh, handwriting. And it had what is known as Hamilton's charge, which is the, his, beyond just what your order should be as an officer uh, representing the Coast Guard, but really how one should treat their fellow countrymen. And it's such a poignant letter. And so it's really beautiful statue mm -hmm. if you ever get up to the academy in connecticut uh and and we ended up working with that same sculptor uh benjamin victor uh on this beautiful statue down in nevis and this is hamilton as a young man and also has a lot of really beautiful significance that we worked on uh, to consult with as well uh thank you helena reynolds for being on with us today her favorite hamilton quote is quote I mean to prepare the way for futurity. So again, that was when he was living in the Caribbean and dreaming of a bigger, uh, impactful life. And Helena adds, Mary Ann Hamilton, uh, who is the widow of a Hamilton descendant, spoke at the 2018 Celebrate Hamilton session at the Grange. She asked me to help her write her stories to help educate folks on Hamilton's unknown contributions. We recently published our book, Destined to be a Hamilton, which opened with this quote. A link to purchase it is on the AHA Society webpage. 
chapter 12 features the stories of how Rand and Mariana and Thomas founded the AHA Society. Marianne suffered a stroke in April 2024 and is partially paralyzed, but sends her greetings. Thank you for this session. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, I would like to close this session with first a reading of the funeral um, notice. On Saturday last, July 14th, 1804, the remains of Alexander Hamilton were committed to the grave with every possible testimony of respect and sorrow. The distant readers may form some idea of what passed on this mournful occasion. We shall here present them with a regular and correct account of the whole scene. The article goes on to list the full procession of everyone that participated. And of course, the funeral procession was first led with the general's horse, appropriately dressed, his children and relatives, and many, many representatives of the city. On the top of the coffin was the general's hat and sword, his boots and spurs reversed across the horse. His gray horse, dressed in mourning, was led by two black servants dressed in white and white turbans trimmed with black. The streets were lined with people, Doors and windows were filled, principally with weeping females, and even the housetops were covered with spectators who came from all parts to behold the melancholy procession. When the advanced platoon of the military reached the church, the whole column wheeled backward by sections from the flanks of platoons, forming a lane, bringing their muskets to a reversed order, and resting the cheek on the butt of the piece in the customary attitude of grief. Through this avenue thus formed, the corpse, preceded by the clergy of different denominations, the Society of Cincinnati, and followed by relations of the deceased and different public bodies, advanced to the church, the band, with drums muffled, playing all the time a pensive, solemn air. And then I just want to read from this part of the funeral oration by Governor Morris, who stood at the stage erected in the portico of Trinity Church with four of Hamilton's sons. Fellow citizens, if on this sad, this solemn occasion, I should endeavor to move your commiseration, it would be doing injustice to that sensibility which has been so generally and so justly manifested. Far from attempting to excite your emotions, I must try to repress my own, and yet I fear that instead of the language of a public speaker, you will only hear the lamentations of a bewailing friend. But I will struggle with my bursting heart to portray that heroic sp spirit which has flown to the mansions of bliss. Then the uh, article, or his oration goes on and it concludes, you all know how he perished, on this last scene, I cannot, I must not dwell. It might excite emotions too strong for your better judgment. Suffer not your indignation to lead to any act which might again offend the insulted majesty of the law. On his part, as from his lips, through my, with my voice, for his voice you will hear no more, let me entreat you to respect yourself. And now, ye ministers of the everlasting God, perform your holy office and commit these ashes of our departed brother to the bosom of the grave. The oration being finished, the corpse was carried to the grave where the usual funeral service was performed by the Reverend Bishop Moore. The troops who had entered the churchyard, formed you hastily read to me, contained things that rendered it desirable for me to recur to my own notes. As I presume no publication will take place in the morning papers, I will have the honor of seeing you again on my return to the city, W.P. Van Ness. So with that, I'm going to see if this will work for all of us. I'm gonna be sharing a video here, and this is with our dear friend, Lou DeLeo, who is a flotilla staff officer, and he's the vocalist and principal trumpet of the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary Band, the Commodore's own, 
thank you to David Cowan for sharing this link for us of a previous AHA Society video.